Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm really chuffed you all come to see me tonight. Overwhelmed. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Hi. <laughs> I'm Adam to speak. Uh, right, let's get things rolling. Go on, then, yeah. So, I think as we usually do with, with guests, let's have a little introduction to your early life, inspirations to get into art, mm -hmm. growing up. Yeah. Well, um, I was born on a council estate in Sheffield called Baitmore. Uh, it's a flat top prefab estate which looks like Butlins but doesn't have the fun. <laughs> and uh, so, we, we, my family originally came uh, like in the back to back terraces next to the steelworks and I came along and we were very overcrowded and they were in the process of knocking down the terraces and these new beautiful estates are being built left, right and centre since 1945 like the Labour government made this big massive project to build council houses and estates and Baitmore was one of those in 1966 so they, they all moved there and I was just born and the whole estate itself wasn't fully finished and the mud paths and everything but for me growing up it was like beautiful because it was it was planned for people the estate itself it had grass everywhere it had trees it had a front and a back garden every house they all looked the same exactly identical houses they were built in the factory and then then just erected and uh, yeah like a utopia and it was that for my entire childhood and my life you know and all my mates we would meet on the back field which is this one big field central to the estate in this big massive horseshoe to everybody it was the back field to everyone we just played football or went to the park and had the idyllic summers and got called in late by our angry mums and so like that so my child was beautiful we were skinny but everybody was skinny and it didn't really matter we were all exactly the, as poor as each other, hand me down clothes and all that malarkey. Um, but that upbringing was the focal point to what I do now, which is basically tell the stories about my childhood, but it's a shared experience, because I know a lot of people in this room and a lot of people who like my work had a very similar experience. So I'm just relating, relating tales that can be have a great resonance with people. And I think that's what's really nice about my work is the connectivity that I get and people tell me about certain paintings that they like of mine and how it makes them feel and that it makes me really wonderfully, you know, really proud and chuffed that I've, I'm doing stuff that people can own as their own. The through lines in the work are clearly there for anyone who's from a working class background. Yeah. I think even the titles, yeah. like Shushin, that's all nice. It's just like... Yeah, exactly. Well, that's, that was a genuine experience. My dad used to work at this factory called Laycox. He worked in for British Steel at one point, but then he eventually became a lathe operator in this making clutch plates for Ford cars, I think it was. And so this Laycox factory, and it had a club attached to it. So every Sunday, I'd be in my itchy trousers, dressed up to the nines, having a miserable time, but playing bingo, and it was absolutely fantastic. And one of the highlights of going to the, club, the working men's club on a Sunday is the collection of uh, behind the bar, the, the little packets of cheese, cheese bread and um, little cheese biscuits and the little silver skin pickled onion. And that, that was like, that was straight, that was gold. That was like, you know, I get one of those eventually and through the night once I've helped me Auntie Joan to play bingo with her, you know. And so, so the, the community that was based around that factory and that working men's club, again, was another joyous experience of that. Um, but yeah, so, so my dad worked shifts, so it was four nights, as they call it, so that's one week, days, one week, nights. And, and on the nights shift, in the daytime, you couldn't have your mates around. You couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't, you had to go around to someone else's house, it was dead work days, and, and play there, because you couldn't make a noise, you know, pain of death. <laughs> To the outside, it looks quite grim with the way that you know, these council estates grew up. But like you say, it's filled with joy. Yeah, but for, for, for that period, certainly. I mean, my brother still lives in our, um, our house. Uh, with, you know, the great Thatcherite movement of Bayou Council was eventually, uh, when my dad passed away, um, it came up as, that we could actually buy it. So my brother bought it for like about 14 grand or something like that. It's not worth much more after that, but. <laughs> 
So whether you agree with buying council houses or not, because I'm 50-50 on that one, I'm telling the customer family's already got one. But yeah, we've had that house now for, uh, I'm 57, so yeah, that's how many years we've owned that. So, so um, yeah, so for now, but then it's getting run down now, obviously. So all the states don't have that kind of, well, I'm, I'm roasted into spectacles, so everything I look back with and everything's absolutely joyous uh, in the most beautiful place on earth. But you know, it's, it's, it's a council estate. <laughs> so what about school then? Because I read yeah. that um, you said that art was the only lesson you didn't get to love in. Yeah, that's, that's the, absolutely true. Yeah, I think I've got, I've not been diagnosed, but I think I've got a touch of dyslexia in there. I still get my B's and my D's mixed up and stuff like that. And I, so I really struggled, really struggled with like academic sort of subjects, even in infants and juniors. And once you're, no, it's not recognised, and once it's not found out or helped, then you're the one that gets left behind. So there's this like kind of um, uh, system of reading and learning. That these, uh, I, I don't think they're called aqua books, but anyway, they were colour based. So you started off at brown and then you ended up at this great, beautiful colour right at the very end, so the Brainiac kids. What, gold? Oh. All right, yeah. So I was still down there in brown when everyone else was going everywhere. And so when you've got, you're, you're floundering and you're drowning in, around this class, so you either just start looking out the window, don't try, or just become the class clown. So I was a class clown. I was basically finding attention elsewhere because I couldn't compete with everybody. But the one thing I could do was paint, or, or, and they got praise for that, and also drama and whatever, anything creative, I was, I was fine, that was my domain. So I, I knew pretty much that somewhere down the line, that's where I'll end up. How were them subjects for you back then? Because they're trying to get rid of them now, aren't they? They're creative. Yeah, they are, it's really sad. It's, it, it is, it's absolutely vital because people like me absolutely have nowhere to go. Yeah. What, you know, I mean, yeah. no, no plan B's around me. No, exactly, yeah, that's it, yeah. When, when, I, when I finally left school, uh, I wanted to be in a band. I, I absolutely adore music, and um, you just you grow up watching Top of the Pops, and you remember seeing like Queen and Freddie Mercury prancing around. And you know, I want to be him. That's who I want to be when I grow up. That's my plan. So when I was like 16 and I was in the sixth form, this um, I, I picked. I assumed that I needed to be in the sixth form, and I assumed I needed to do something after that, but I wasn't sure. So I decided to go on to the sixth form, and. Uh, I picked the easiest subjects known to mankind to try and get, a, get through this, this particular period. So one year into it, I'm very lax, and I'm in the common room playing um, cards with all the rest of the mates who smoke. And this woodwork teacher came in, who had to I put woodwork down, it's one of the subjects in the sixth form. And he said, what are you doing here? And he didn't mean, what am I doing in the common room playing cards? He said, what am I doing in the sixth form? You know, I was wasting my time, wasting everybody's time. So I went to my brother and said, is any, any jobs good enough at your factory? Can you get us an interview? So sure enough, on Monday, when I asked, on the Tuesday, he said, yeah, you've got a, an interview. And now I got the job. And so I worked in this like, factory doing menial jobs for about two years. But at that point, I was in a band. I got a, a guitar, and then I got a keyboard or whatever. And, and that was going to be, anyway, it was going to be on top of the pops in a couple of years. So working in a factory didn't matter. It didn't matter that I didn't have an academic education. So are you just doing the music at this point? No, no I, 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 I take it on well, that. The, 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 if you've got a band, there's two people you need in a band. One's an artist and one's a driver. So you've got the one who can get your speakers and the other one can do the LP sleeves. So I was the LP sleeve person in the band. And uh, so, so that was that. And so for like five years, through different bands and changes and stuff, I was trying desperately to... to make it and get a record deal in these bands and after a bit, after about five or six years you get this epiphany, you wake up one morning and like the games, like the woodwork teacher, what are you doing here? And literally so I packed in, I packed in the band and then I went and did an art foundation course and thought well I'll uh, take art as the next step. So what age is this? Uh, late teens? Uh, no, for, so for when it came to the art foundation I think it was about 24. How did it feel being, I'm guessing you're a bit older than the rest of the kids at that point then? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, well, I was, yeah, I was, I was like the kind of... Like mature student. The, the dad. Yeah. <laughs> so like cool, cool guy. Used to be a man. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's the one, yeah. Uh, so, 
So I, I, left, I left work, so I, by then I was working at HMV Record Stores, and I did that for about four or five years. It was brilliant, absolutely. It was, a, uh, it was a, a glorious time to work in a record shop. We used to have this system at HMV, because they really were big on people getting knowledge about other music, so you could borrow three albums a night, and you'd tape them, and then you'd put them back and put them on the shelf to sell. But I had a fantastic collection of uh, tapes, so that was great. And it was just legal. I know. No. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that was how they got the staff to get educated into the music and stuff. And you got, I've, I've got lifetime mates from working there. You know, one of my mates who uh, I met at the, the H and we're in the same band together, which we might talk about later. So yeah, I went to H and B, and then I checked that in and did this foundation course in the means to go into um, graphic design, like you guys, you know and go to university. So I did that for a year. I applied to go to Newcastle University. I showed them my portfolio. I had no real plan, actually. I didn't know why I chose Newcastle. I had a mate who was in Leeds. I didn't want to go to Leeds. So I decided to go to Newcastle. And I didn't get in, which was, thank God. Because I did, again, I'd just be wasting my time. I'd have been, there'd have been a lecture a year in going, what are you doing here? <laughs> so I didn't get in, and that meant, all right, I'm not good in education, but I want to do art. The one thing that you can do is cartoons, because no one's asking you what your CV is, no one's asking you what your education is, or where you come from. Is it funny? And that's the only criteria for a cartoon. You don't have to be a good drawing, as long as it's funny. And that's one of the key mistakes some cartoonists make, is they'll put like hours and hours into a drawing, but not, it'll not be funny, and it doesn't hit, and it misses. So the first thing you've got to be is, if you're going to be a cartoonist, is make them laugh. And then you can have the most basic drawing ever. It doesn't matter. Function over format. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, just before we kind of move on from that, I've got two questions. Yeah. What was the band called? Which one? Oh, there was multiple. No, there were two bands. So the first band, um, I thought racehorse names were good names. Because of my dad. <laughs> I know, it's where I grew up because I used to draw on betting slips. We didn't have art paper, but we had, had Labrooks uh, betting slips, so I'd be using those. If you tried doing homework with your Labrooks pen, <laughs> English homework, you couldn't do two sides, you wanted them pens, but there you go. So um, I, uh, I, looked, I scanned through all the racehorses, and there was one group called Miami Star, which I thought was nice, and one called Miami Dolphins. And I thought, wow, that's a great name for a band, because we were into like John Barry kind of music and stuff like that at that time. So I was big into the specials, but one of the members of the specials was Jerry Damas, and he was going down this music route, and it was all about like this influence of John Barry and stuff. And so we knew about that as kids, and so we thought, I thought Miami Dolphins is great, so we were called ourselves the Miami Dolphins, we were that for two years, and then my brother went to America and he came back with this Miami Dolphins t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's this? Yeah, it's an American football team. Yeah. Do you know about that? No! You must have been American. Yeah, well, that ain't about that. Yeah, and then uh, so uh, we met a couple of mates, and we started a new band called Times Will Change, and where our music was like blue-eyed pop, so we were big into like um, orange juice and blow monkeys and stuff like that, so it was funky and pop. Yeah. Um, so bringing it back to to the to the exhibition, there's a lot of kind of emotion in the, the piece of work that are here and and just that we've done around football, mm. around people's expressions, you know. <laughs> What was your relationship with football in that time frame, you know, from being a kid to like the 20s? Yeah. Well, it's really, it's really kind of, that kind of sets you up for the rest of your life, I think. It is, it's, it's, it's funny, it's like a, football's a disease. If, you, if, you, if you're into football, it takes over your being and your soul. It, doesn't, it has no logic to it whatsoever because you end up supporting a side that's in the third division and playing crap. It's like but a bad, bad relationship. A bad relationship. It says yeah, you're abused constantly. But you see going back, knowing something better is going to happen. And um, so my family, all my family are Wednesdayites, so there was no choice. I had to be a Wednesdayite. And then there came a point where my dad would let me... My dad or my brothers would turn into the match. So there's a, there's a painting that might be on this reel at some point, and it's a bloke and a kid in an empty set of seats just them two and it's called Half Time Sweets and it was kind of my brother would take me onto the stand when I were about nine or ten and he'd make sure I got enough sweets to keep me quiet 
while the football were on because I was boring as hell. I was looking at the houses across there and when you lived in them rather than what was going on in the pitch. So that was about that. That was about how you, if you take a kid to a football match too young, make sure they've got plenty of sweets to eat. And, but then there comes a point where you get it and you can go with your mates and there's another one that's up there and it's called Early Doors and it's a group of kids hanging off the crush barriers on the cop. That's my experience, but it's, it's, it's universal for every other ground. And you get there just as the gates open and you just lull around <laughs> for an hour and a half waiting for the game to start. But it becomes part of a fabric, it's a ritual, and that's what I really like about football, is that everyone who's a football, football fan in this audience will, if they go and play, watch a game, have a ritual, and it might be you meet a certain a set of mates in one pub, and it'll be that forever. You'll not change that pub, you'll not change maybe what colour clothes you wear, you might not wear, like I'm a Wednesday night, so I have no way I'm going to wear red um, on a Saturday. Got your blue and white striped white. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and it's, that's what's, what I love about that is this, this, this format. And even on a Saturday when I was a kid and not going to the match, I was the one doing the polls while my dad cut the tea because I lost my mum when I was uh, seven to cancer. So my dad brought me up and looked after us. So he was the one doing all the teas and stuff. So on a Saturday, I was in charge of doing the polls and that was like a a, a massive deal, you know what I mean? And you were just there and scared to death they might make a mistake and make their own mark. It, we never won anything, obviously, <laughs> you know. It, it was really nice to be able to listen to those results going down and you're taking it up. And again, it's ritualistic. Oh yeah, that's the half-time sweet one, yeah. And oh, there we go. There's time. early doors. And so, yeah, that's what I like about football as much as anything else, is that uh, thing where you go with your parents, you go with your mates, you go with your son, so I go to the football match. I had a season ticket up until last, this year and I, I had my two brothers in front of me and me and my son next to me, you know, and we'd jump and hug each other when we scored a goal and we took them full when we weren't doing anything, you know, and, and that's, that's the beauty of football. Those are the, definitely the kind of feelings that we wanted to bring into this exhibition. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. The emotions, not to get too... Well, that's, I mean, the thing about the casual movement is that that's all ritualistic. It, it, it mattered what clothes you wore, it mattered what you, where you looked. I remember, uh, I'll, I'll make a confession now, that I wasn't a casual when I was a kid. I was into other kinds of music, I was into more into music at the time, but my mates around me were. And I, and I think Dave might Dave agree or disagree, but wasn't like certain looks bound by where you came from? Were there certain... Bands, as in pubs? Uh, no, the, the look, the casual look. So, like in Sheffield, they had fire trousers, which is like the most grown up that pair of trousers you could possibly own. But apparently, they were cool, and now I'm like, mystified. I'm into like the specials and scar movement, and these guys are wearing that trousers. <laughs> but they, they cut them, they, they won't turn them up, so they have a split up the side. And uh, that, I didn't know if that was in Sheffield or not. And so, the Pringle sweaters, fire, fire trousers. Uh, was, was that look that my mates had? And so I, I don't know whether it was regional, the, the casual look, or it yeah, was universal. Yeah, there were a lot of looks everywhere, wasn't it? Different, different types of looks, different stuff. places and everything. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. so uh, but I found that fascinating. I, I find all, all pop cultures fascinating, the clothes and everything, and the identity that we have, because as kids, it's sometimes the only thing we've got to mark ourselves with. Yeah. You know, if, we, if we've got a, a, a terrible or a, or a crap um, surroundings or background, the one thing we can have is uh, an identity, and we can form that by either watching bands on top of the pops and em emulating them, or we, or we emulate our mates and what they're, and you come apart the tribe, and whatever, whether you're a mod, a rocker, a casual, you, you've got an identity, you've got a, a belonging, and I think that's, you know, it's incredibly vital for everybody. Upbringing uh, and uh, it was great in the 80s because there were about six or seven different factions going off all at once. We used to go to this youth club uh, in my school called Rollinson, and every faction had like half an hour uh, slot the songs. So they were like these Northern Soul came on, and it were all the hard kids who were older than us, and they got my mum and dad tattooed on the necks. But you just like so, so to this day, whenever I do Northern Soul, is that to me they're just like these. Godlike kind of, and the, ruff, the ruffians as well. That's the, that was the thing. That those kids on the estate were the ones you avoided, avoid the savages or the, or whatever, whatever their surnames were. You don't go anywhere near them. But they were the ones dancing to Northern Soul, and they were like angels, 
just like grace, you know, these this moves they were making, and it, like, it was so contradictory to who they were outside, smacking you across the back of head and terrorizing the neighborhood. But put like uh, an open soul song and then they're skipping away, and it's just amazing. Yeah. So, when you didn't get into college in Newcastle, yeah. How did that affect your mindset? Did you think, right, that's it, I'm not going to bother? Or did it push you? Oh, it's brilliant. I, I, I'm, I'm a very much, I'm driven by a fucker. Yeah. Yeah, I told through my life, just, <laughs> fuck you. I'll show you. And it's, it's the only way that I uh, survived, to be honest with you. I, I, if, I'm, if I'm in, like, uh, a happy place, and I'll just end up watching Arms Under the Hammer. <laughs> so, <laughs> and getting no done. So I need, I need a challenge, I need a, an adversary. And so that first one was that. And it also came at a pivotal time, because I sat going out with this girl and fell madly in love with her. And we're married now to this day, but I met her at a party uh, in October. I proposed marriage in February. And we got married in March, and we're, you know, we're just celebrating our 31st year next month. So, so you know, it was like a whirlwind in all nights. But I knew she was the one for me, you know what I mean? But that then came when we got, she got pregnant uh, soon after we got married, and then our, our child was born a year later, and she got two kids as well from a previous marriage. And so I was like a stepdad to them at weekends and school holidays and things. Um, and so I then be, it became a massive focus to me to make something happen because my wife was from bipolar, so she couldn't hold down a job. So that I, would, I had to be at hand for her as well in case when the times got tough, and also be a provider. And the only way I could really do that was to like kind of wheel and deal and, and try and sell cartoons and work at the same time. So I had a part-time job. I worked as a postman for a few for about five years, and then I worked at Tesco's. And these were jobs that started early and finished sort of in the same afternoon. And I could do my cartoon work, send that off. And so I'd be sending it off to greeting card companies and newspapers and stuff like that and making this sort of... Was, do, was, that, regular, was that regular work, the cartoon? The cartoon was regular at some report because in the first job I ever got, the first paid one, was doing a football fanzine called A View from the East Bank. Uh, I went to the matches and I saw this particular uh, fanzine had come out and it didn't have any cartoons in it. So I thought, well, if I do some cartoons for these guys, maybe they'll pay me. So I got in contact with the editor and I did about eight, eight or seven cartoons. And he paid, I said, I won't pay for these though. So he gave me 50 quid. And he gave me 50 quid throughout every, every two weeks or whatever, whenever the fanzine came out, I got 50 quid and I did like 10 cartoons. I'd kill myself for this 50 quid, but 50 quid in none end of week, which was fantastic. And then a newspaper, in the, my local newspaper, the Sheffield Telegraph, picked up on the cartoons I was doing and put, published one on the back page. So I rang them up and I said, oh, thanks for putting that fanzine cartoon on the back page. Is there any chance you can pay me for that? <laughs> and also, do you want me to do any, any more for you? And this old guy, an old, old school journalist called Peter Markey from Glasgow, he was a sports editor. And I think I, he took a shine to me because of my my, um, my forcefulness. Yes. <laughs> and so he said, yeah, fair enough. So I did two cartoons a week for them, and, and the fanzine one, and the cartoons I did for the Telegraph, I think I got 15 quid per cartoon. And that, I did that for about 15 years, and it didn't go up. <laughs> In those 15 years, I did two cartoons a week, for 30 quid. <laughs> so it's like our prices, you know, didn't rise with your reputation. No, no, not at all, no. But uh, that, that was what happened there with that is, it came a point like when the epiphany with the record, the, the band, and the, the sixth form and all this, and the epiphany came to me that I'm not going anywhere. I've got this family, we live on a council estate. We've got, uh, I've got three kids. We're in crippling debt. We're, we're, I'm cashing uh, checks. Week in, week out, of those check exchange places. I've got red, uh, let, uh, you know, letters left, right, and centre uh, about debts I'm in and stuff. I'm in a bad position, and I knew that something had to change to our situation. And fine art was that um, that epiphany, really. So you picked up the paintbrush then? Yeah, I did. Yeah, it, and that was like 2005, for 
and um, this is where the interesting period happens then. Yeah, then it becomes a whirlwind then, yeah, yeah so that's between right. Between 2005 and 2010, yeah. a lot happens. <laughs> it does. But it's, it's, a, sorry, go for it. it's a crazy thing though, to say you had an epiphany <sighs> and pick, going into fine art was the thing because Sometimes it takes a long time for fine artists to get yeah. to get known. But like Adam said, this next period now is yeah. like a whirlwind. Well, one thing that worked in my favour um, was working for the Sheffield Telegraph. So I, I think so. I got a name in Sheffield by any chance, but I got a newspaper that was backing me from my side. Uh, so I decided I'd, I'd uh, start this this process of fine art now. I couldn't paint, I can't, I've not had any training in painting whatsoever, but I, I, I can draw, I can draw cartoons. But I knew that I needed a style that would, could marry the two. And it's, it's an amalgamation of a couple of things. It's, there's a 60s artist called Patrick Caulfield, and his work's primary colours and black lines, so it's like clocks and, and lamps and windows and houses and interiors. And I saw his work in an art gallery in Sheffield when I was 15 and it blew my mind. I'm thinking, this guy is like a, he's doing cartoons, but it's art and it's amazing. So, some are just like a jug and an orange. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, and they're beautiful. It's so simplistic. And then the other one is obviously, uh, is Hergé um, Tintin. And so it's the colours that he uses that I, I really like, the muted pastels tone. So I used his. Patrick Caulfield's idea of flat colour and black lines and Hershey's colour template. But then I also used Hopper's idea of the concept of melancholy to create emotion. Because what you need to do as an artist is, is, is have a connectivity with the, the artist and the viewer. You, you, there's no point looking around at an exhibition of art if you haven't got a connection with it. You'll just walk past it, you'll, you'll gloss over. But if you can suddenly talk to somebody and they can feel that emotion, uh, what you're trying to get, then you've got a got a chance then to, to get them and grab them and so for me the two things are to either make someone laugh or to make them feel kind of sad, slightly sad in a way so they're the two emotions that I play with in my artwork it's like a little dance to get people so that's why nostalgia is really good because once I've got people talking about the past and things that they remember then they've got another connectivity so it's, again it's, it's not the for me it's not the the drawing that's the problem is it's, it's, it's the story. So like the cartoon, like the cartoon gag, it's the gag, not the the, the, the artwork. So because I, I would all be under one of the greatest artists in the world by any stretch of the imagination, it's just I, I, I know how to tell a good story. Hopefully, that's what people like about it. Yeah, I think so. I is think it so. Interesting that you mentioned Hopper and Caulfield because I was going to bring those up. I'm oh still, yeah, I've stolen no, my art history fun. <laughs> but something, tell, yeah. something I wanted to just touch on with that is perfect example of that um the way that i i love the bits in your paintings which are just blue sky oh yeah large large <laughs> areas <laughs> large areas that just frame what else is going on it's almost like negative space yeah right? yeah that's it because the story is that it's the kids in the field and that's that painting is the arctic monkeys decide to form a band and and, <laughs> and it would have happened like that because those kids were just playing kicking about football all intents and purposes, they got football gear on, but at some point they form a band, and at some point that band becomes mega. But, it, but the starting point now is just kids on the field playing football and coming up with a daft idea. And that's what I, I wanted to get across with that painting is for everybody, uh, every working class kid, there's a dream. Uh, it's whether it's to be a footballer or a pop star, or, or not necessarily an actor, unfortunately. That, that's kind of like, it seems like it's a it's, it's a glass, it's a ceiling that's not going to get broken too far. Yeah, I mean, I really wanted to be as a kid an actor, but I could never go to my dad. My dad, Dad, I want to be an actor. <laughs> as he comes in from his shift yeah, as a layer of footballer and yeah. musician yeah. is much more palatable. That's right, yeah. yeah. And so, um, so, yeah, so that's what I like about those stories is, is that like kind of dream. And like football was massive growing up. I mean, I mean now the working class sport is probably boxing more than football. Because now it costs money to go to football because you've got to go to these Lots of clubs rather than after school things and stuff like that. So it becomes a little bit more soccer parents, isn't it? In big cars driving people. Yeah, so, so yeah, so that's, it's important for working class people to have a, a, a dream. 
kids, should I say? Yeah. So some of these kids, like the African kids, like Noel Gallagher. Yeah. Your friends. Collaborators. <laughs> yeah. this, this period of 2005 to 2010. Yeah. Um, the Arctic Monkeys, Noel Gallagher gets in touch. You work with Paul Smith. Yeah. Um, Clark's collaboration comes along. I know, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that because. Um, so, what I did to, to, to get established, like you say, it takes years. So, I tried to do it quickly. So, um, yeah, I had a strategy. Yeah, I had a strategy. Yeah, I had a strategy. I knew that the style that I'd got was going to work. I remember working at Tesco's doing home shopping and, uh, and I'd just done a couple of these paintings. And I said, uh, said to this guy, oh yeah, I've started painting that, and uh, one day I'm going to start charging 500 quid for these. And he just laughed, he just laughed. But I knew what we were going to, I just knew that this style was going to get, yeah. Laugh. I didn't know what I was going to do with this style at that point. So I was like kind of doing like Americana and stuff like that, and like cactuses and gumball machines and stuff. Uh, and then I watched this documentary, and it was Ray Charles. And Ray Charles was going, and going oh yeah, when I was a... When I was just this young kid, I was going around all these bars and they were doing Nat King Cole songs in a Nat King Cole style. And this guy came up to me and he said, Ray, you're good at Nat King Cole, but there's one person better than you at Nat King Cole. And he says, who's that? Nat King Cole. Who's Ray Charles? What's Ray Charles do? And he said he had to be himself. He learned to be himself. And I thought, yeah, I've got to be me. I've got to, my art, I've got to, the only way I can get this stuff across is to do the sugar that I'm 100 percent about, not Americana, but where I come from. Sheffield. Sheffield, yeah, yeah, yeah Yorkshire, that's it. Yorkshire, Sheffield. So that was it. That, that was the that, that was a catalyst to that. And then so there was this art show in Sheffield every year called the now oh, I can't remember it's in this park, art in the park. There you go. And they have these stalls for normal people, and then they have these stalls you have to buy for professional artists. And I went to one of the, the person organising, how much is it for a professional artist though? And he says, well, uh, we don't normally give them out, but it's such and such. I'm like, right, can I buy one? Can I spend some money on this? And this is the point where I was still skinned. But I knew that if I established myself as a professional artist, then there already people are thinking. And in my head, to sell art, to ask somebody who just works in a normal job in a shop to spend 500 quid on a piece of artwork, they want to know that some they're spending wisely, they're not, and they get like grifted in some way further down the line. So if I can get the newspaper to talk about me, then that in their heads will associate me as a known artist, whether I am or not, smoke and mirrors. Just selling your brand. Selling the brand, yeah. So, uh, that is a strategy. Yeah, um, yeah so, they, so for me, so then I didn't start that at that time at 500. I did it first, my first exhibition in the pub called The Washington, where me and my wife got married. And the paintings all the way around the side, it was just before Christmas. And I managed to sell two or three paintings, but I originally put up 500 quid and stuff like that, and no one was taking any bait, so I knocked them right down to like 90 quid and 120. So I sold two of these paintings, 120 quid, and it made Christmas it looking brilliant. I got kids presents and all sorts of race. And then straight quick back at that, this other uh, bar said, can we have a show in, in January? Well, this show was still going until January anyway in the pub, which is just a real size of pain another 25 paintings through December just so I could show them in January in this other bar and again that's when the Arctic Monkeys saw my work and asked me to get involved with it then and then there was this little restaurant called Masha House it was tiny and I did these 90 pound paintings and I put them on the wall and every week I'd go back and, and change, change them because we're selling and putting them up and then I was just doing all these little shows and slowly but surely people were buying them and buying them and it got to a point maybe two years in uh, that I got like seven grand worth of money, one way or another, whether it's coming in through commissions or uh, sold paintings. And at that point, my, my wife's dad had passed away, and I knew that I'd have to look after her. I couldn't keep working at Tesco because she was going to go in, into a, an episode of bipolar, going down a downward spiral. So I had to take some time off. And we sort of said to each other, My wife's incredible because she's been so supportive throughout all of this that, well, listen, that. Seven grand is, is basically what you get at Tesco's in, in a year. Why not pack Tesco's in and we'll see how far this seven grand will take us? So I did, I packed Tesco's in and I didn't look back from that moment on, you know. I never, I never had to. Was it still scary for you? 
the other take, uh, that, take that lead. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but everything about uh, my life at that point was scary. Yeah, Waking yeah. up and seeing the next letter come through letterbox. Yeah. So, but it, so she was so brave and so thing. But because I would have been on a tidal wave with this stuff being selling, uh, that it, it, it felt I thought we could give it a go. Yeah, and the then it's further down. And so what I would do then as well is to try and like, like say with Paul Smith, for instance, I did this painting called Chopper Boy. There's a guy in a, a blue, blue marked, Mark one chopper, which was the one that I got for Christmas. A second hand chopper for Christmas one, so it was brilliant. Yeah. The great thing about choppers is there was the Mark one and the Mark two. The Mark one had a longer seat, and that's when everybody were on the back of those paddling downhills and dying with the flares getting caught in the <laughs> chain. So they made a mark two and shortened the seat and said, no, pillion passengers. And that was a word that just learned as a kid, pillion. What was that? But anyway, so they said, don't take any backers on this one. Uh, so I had the mark, two, mark one second hand, where all the ones about Christmas, all the rich kids on the estate were getting the mark two. So I had a cooler bike, even though it had stickers on it uh, from the previous owner. Uh, so anyway, so I did this painting and I sent, I sent a print of it, I think it was, to Paul Smith, to his office. And he sent a letter back and said, oh, thank you for your gift, I love it. If you're ever in London, uh, give us a call and you know, pop in and see me. I said, fuck that, I'm coming to London next week. <laughs> <laughs> so me, my two sons and my wife, we got train tickets to London. We let Paul Smith know we're going to London on, uh, on Thursday. And we're, we're in the neighbourhood, can we come and see you? And bless him, he does, he goes, yeah, fair enough. So we go up into his office, and uh, he's you know, like, do you want a cup of tea? Yeah, definitely. So cups of tea, that posh chocolate biscuits, you know those with like thick chocolate on the top, is it leaps and biscuits? Oh man, alive. So we've got those. But his office is brilliant. It's this big old space. It's like from, from one side to this, a bit like that. It's got this big desk, but everything is piled, absolutely piled with things people have sent It looks like a mess, but it's yeah. perfect. He knows it's everything, he'll take it around. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's the desk clear in the middle and everywhere else is yeah. chaos. That's right, yeah. It's like yeah. It's, it's, got, it's got two rooms like that, yeah. with all these things. And uh, so we showed this around, we having this great time. So we have this little kind of, you know, relationship. And so I've done things for him. I've done an exhibition in Japan, which was interesting because we've got this exhibition booked in. He wants it. Pete, will you show some work at the shop in, in Tokyo? Because uh, they're celebrating like 20 years in, in, in Japan for me. Uh, I said, yeah. So I, I did an entire new show. I got a book translated into Japanese uh, so they could sell it there. And uh, it, so I did these original, I think he, he thought I was going to send prints, of just my back catalogue. But again, it's book that, I'm going to have a proper show. So I did all this. And so I kept sending these letters to him, emails, oh, uh, not to him, obviously, to, to his staff. And, oh, yeah, we're looking, can't wait for this thing, and we're thinking about going, going over to see it as well. Nothing, I'm thinking, come on, give us a ticket, give us a plane ticket. <laughs> Nada, nothing. And I'm looking at prices, the planes to Tokyo by this way, and the woman here was starting off at like 300 quid, and by the time we're getting closer and closer to the show, we're going up to 700 quid a flight. I'm thinking, he's not, gonna, he's not taking a bait yet, yeah, we're going to have to go. If we're going to do it, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I said, no, oh, fuck it, let's buy a ticket. So me and my wife and uh, uh, my two, two sons, uh, we basically bought tickets for us, went over on a plane and we spent four nights in Tokyo and his staff were lovely. They showed us some great little places to eat, little sushi bars. We basically did a Lost in Translation tour. <laughs> so we went into the cocktail bar upon Park Hyatt Hotel and stuff like that. And uh, so the great, great, great time there. And uh, yeah, and we went to this, the, this night, uh, opening night to celebrate. It was in his main shop in this particular region, and he was thronging, thronging. This ad adulation of Paul Smith, the Japanese, is, is amazing. It was a great experience. But one day, I went up to his office, and I'd been, I'd been in the uh, airport prior to going to Tokyo, and I saw these. Uh, Paul Smith sunglasses in this shop. I didn't buy them because I couldn't afford them, obviously. So I went back and saw him eventually. And I said, Oh, Paul, we're in, we're in the airport. And I saw these sunglasses of yours. They were absolutely fantastic. So, did you like it? Yeah. James, so he gets his, his, side, his side mate, James, to come along. He says, Can you take Peter down to the bottom and uh, find these glasses that he really likes? I'm thinking, Yes. <laughs> 
uh, so I texted me down, lifts down into the basement, past all these other like hobbits working, tailing away and drawing and designing. And he goes to this other guy, uh, Gustav or whatever, and says, Can you get these glasses out from season uh, 10? Oh, yeah. So the big, what your glasses come out? Sunglasses, bang, they're there, the ones I wanted. He says, There, then. So oh, bang on them, one second, gets these glasses out, looks at the side, gets a piece of paper, writes this code down. Well, if you just take them to any shop and ask for them, <laughs> you can order them. <laughs> and look at you bastard. <laughs> I've been sled down this path. I don't think I'm going to get this freebie of glasses from Paul Smith. It's how you get. You don't even get the yeah. yeah, go to an optician to get these glasses. No. But it's a great lesson. I mean, I, don't, I have never learned it. It's don't get out of way. But I, I'm a bit more generous than Paul Smith is. But he's, he started with nothing apart from a, a, a little shop in Nottingham, which is 12 foot square. And just grew and grew and grew, you know. And uh, he, were, he were going to America buying these kit bags like cans kit bags, taking them over and printing on them and flogging them and things, you know, and he hustled. And, you know, it, it, and I think that's what he saw in me, I guess, was that hustler trying to fight. He still wanted to teach you a lesson. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it was good that way, yeah, absolutely. It was all about, one of the lessons he told me as well is, yeah, because obviously what I try and do with my work is not, obviously, it's not just sell the original artwork, it's also trying to sell stuff related to that original artwork, so it's mugs and t-shirts or whatever. I can try and monetize what I can to keep keep uh, you know kids with new shoes and stuff like that. And he just sort of said that your product, he says, all your profits in the ones you've not sold. So you, you can sell 50 mugs, but if you've got 50 mugs still on the side, you've not made any profit what services, you've just got to make sure that all your margins and stuff. So that was like a businessman sort of thing. But it's a little, it's, it's, an, it's a good thing to learn that sort of stuff, because you don't know it. Yeah. You're not going to get that from the woodwork teacher. No. <laughs> That's class, that. And how about the Clarks? I'm a big fan of Clarks, so I'm interested to hear that. I think that was a similar thing. I think they just caught wind about the work and uh, just asked to get these. The difficult thing about doing collaborations with fashion is there's no money in it at all. You're not, you're, they, they base it on kudos. The, you, you, all you're going to get from that is your, your name up in lights that you've done this collab, but you're not actually going to profit from it in any way. Unless potentially you get work off the back of that because people have seen it. <coughs> well, that's, the, that's, that's, their, that's their gambit. Mm. So it, it's whether you want to do that or not. Yeah, it's and it very rarely pays exactly. off that way. But it's yeah. nice to talk about because here we are sat here and I've done a club with we, we clock, which is great. And I'm not going to diss it, don't get me wrong, but at the end of the day, I've got to pay my mortgage. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> That's true. I'm sorry to be so merciless about this uh, <laughs> business. It's been on Paul Smith, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> These two guys with the faces on shoes and then just made <laughs> um, So, 2010, you opened your exhibition, presumably to sell more art and mugs, etc. Oh, which one's that? Uh, the first exhibit. Oh no, no. First gallery, sorry. The first oh, the gallery. gallery. Yeah, yeah. That. Well, I, this is being filmed. But I used to have a manager uh, for a bit. You know, like you're in a band, and you assume you need a manager to get you somewhere. I assume because I was an artist, and I'm not very good at business. I needed someone who was good at business to become a manager. So I had a friend who I used to work for at H and V, and he suggested that his uh, father-in-law would be a good person to go. It was. It was very Machiavellian as a character. And I thought that might be something that I, would be useful, and it, and it sort of settled quite quickly. And I had to go through um, legal uh, things to get out of contracts that I'd signed. And long shot, short shot is it, the contracts I'd signed um, weren't necessarily in my favour, so I was okay to break from the relationship. Uh, so I, I'd come through a very and that was very expensive, a very pricey process to do that. But again, it was like kind of a, you've got to learn, you've got to learn from everything that happens to you. Every, every adversity is something that you sort of get right. Well, that didn't work. Move from, learn from it and move forward. So, so from that, when that period was, was done, we, uh, I, I then decided we needed a gallery and I got an accountant by then. And uh, he said, yeah, well, all you need to do is sell one painting a week and you can afford your gallery. So that Let's give it a go. Yeah, it's still going, so yeah, it's still going. Yeah, that's well. good. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. Yeah. Well, I noticed like with the other artists in a similar kind of situation that I am that are tied to. Well, like, I'm not, but some artists like I think it's called Doug Hyde, and he's tied to a publishing company, and he had a gallery for a while. And I don't think 
task about five years, and I assume that my guy will last about that, and people get bored of me and move on. But so far, so good. I've been there for about 10 years now, so keep touching wood, it keeps going. <laughs> um, so, we're going to take some questions now. Oh, right, okay. Straight into it. Pete, um, we've got a whippet called Alfie. Really? Um, and we must have about a dozen and a half of your paintings. <laughs> um, are you going to do any more? Because well, we want to come to your gallery um, and see some of your Sunday sketches and then get some more. Oh, right. Uh, am I going to do any more whippet paintings? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I should, shouldn't I? Yes, definitely. Yes. Yes. I will, I will. I will make sure that... We... Well, that one, that's one of the first ever paintings I did. It was called Sunday Morning Whippets. Yes. And that's the first time I did a, a whippet and the Frank Kites came from that. And uh, I was helping my brother-in-law, who was an electrician, uh, rewire a house when I were a kid. Uh, and at lunchtime on a Sunday when we were rewiring this house, we popped into this pub in Darnell and it was empty when we got in there. Then by about you know, one o'clock, all these people started coming in with whippies and uh, a whole, whole gang of them and it basically they were uh, course racing with them, is that right? Where they basically set the whippies off and chase a rag or something. And so that's what that was and it just stuck in my mind and then so like five or you know, ten years later I did this painting about that, this guy walking through the estate with his whippet to, to race it. Yeah. That will do more whippets. <laughs> Volume. Hi, Pete. Um, I know we've had a few health problems in the last five or ten years. Yeah. But we spoke to Dave White a week or two ago, and his wife wasn't well, and it's changed his perspective on the type of art that he's done. Right. Has that, that yeah. life problems made you consider or think yeah, about it? Yeah, well, it did, it did, because um, I, I've, got, I've got a liver transplant, and uh, I had that seven years ago. I've recently had a heart valve, mechanical, mechanical heart valve put in, and a pacemaker, and I've had a couple of another procedure. But um, when, when I was getting ill and ill with the, the liver disease, I, um, I, would, I became the shadow of who I am then, or I was, and who I am now. Uh, and, I was, and I got a friend who passed away with liver disease. We were actually were in the same class together at school. It was really weird. And um, he ran, I remember once we had this little reunion and he weren't drinking. I said, why are you not drinking? He said, oh, well, I've got this liver problem. And uh, so I've been told, you know, I can't drink. And then I ended up getting diagnosed with cirrhosis and so I rang him up and met up with him and we became friends again and he went on this journey together and he was had cirrhosis for quite a while he'd been at it for 10 years so I thought I got another 10 years in maybe before I ended up with any operations and stuff but he got progressively ill as we were going on through this journey together and unfortunately he didn't make it he he passed away uh, he was in hospital he had the chance of having a transplant but while he was in hospital he ended up getting uh, uh, the, the, the hospital book um, and it MRSA, MRSA and, it, and it, it, it didn't survive it because it was too weak at that point so unfortunately he passed away so I was very aware of my own immortality that, that at some point my mortality that at some point I may not get this operation I may not get this transplant so um, I eventually did fortunately and then my next show straight after the, my operation was this this class work show which was about how the working class works as a culture. And uh, one of the paintings that I did was called Remember Me As I Was and How We Were and Not As I Am. And it's, and it's this old guy and his family's around him and his wife's there and this nurse is turning him in the bed. And it's all uncomfortable and it's all clumsy and he's at his end of life and he doesn't want, and I didn't want my family to have last memories to me as this shell of a person that was uh, you know, slowly dying of liver disease, and uh, it really affected me. So I did this painting, and I curtained it off, and uh, I got uh, uh, a friend of mine. I, I'm not going to name drop. So he, he did this piece of music, like cathedral music. I had this sandbox in front of the painting, and I got all these lollipop sticks, 
And I said, because you know how you go to a Catholic church, I'm not, I'm an atheist, but I like going into Catholic churches in Spain and stuff, and there's all these little votive candles, you can put a, a euro in and you get this little candle gets lit, and I really like that. So I got these, I got these lollipop sticks and I asked people that if they wanted to write down uh, a name of this person they've lost. And by the end of the show, it was on for about eight days, the, the sandbox was completely full of all those lollipop sticks. And uh, you know, it really affected people, that painting. But yeah, to go back to your <laughs> original question, yeah, it really changed how I can, uh, the, 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 the certain aspects of that mortality and life and death, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, some good really come out about from him. Sorry? You're a fantastic golfer now, I believe. Because oh, yeah, well, because now I've got a Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, if you've got if you're a transplant patient or you're, you're, uh, you're a donor or you're, your partner's been a donor, um, you, there's a transplant games so you can participate and it's just basically to show people this life after a transplant. So the only sports I could think I could possibly achieve is one of them was golf and the other one was darts. Which is, uh, so I wanted to give myself a challenge I decided to take up golf and my son took it up with me as well and that was like three years ago. So in mind to compete in the Leeds golf tournament for the transplant games and uh, the, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I mean, my, my, my brother, uh, he's played golf all his life, so it, it has some bearings on working class, but if you say golf to anyone, you just think wanker. <laughs> so, I am a golf wanker, there's nothing I can do about that. That's when I say to people, I play golf, they just think wanker. <laughs> but it's a great, it's a great thing, it really is. Once you got into it, and having that five mile walk, if someone said to me, do you want to go for a five mile walk? I'm like, no, I'm watching them homes under the hammer. <laughs> but make a sport out of it. Yeah, well, go on then. Yeah, so, so, to, to, to all football fans, I've, I've now, I've now, that's what my season ticket for Sheffield Wednesday, for membership to a golf club. Oh, yeah. So, the most, I, and you know, I'm thinking like, would Picasso be a golfer? No. So can we, can we expect a load of golf and paintings? Uh, there's one in there. Is yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Well, they've got loads of money. I should just start doing, doing golf stuff. And um, what made you paint the way you did a path? You know, it's like cartoon, yeah? Yeah. Um, so why didn't you do fine painting? Why didn't you do other styles? Be because I can't. <laughs> I can't. I can't paint myself out in a paper I'll bag. Just hand it back in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the simple thing. I can only do why I'm, I'm, I'm slowly dropping the lines. Recently, my new sort of style is taking the lines away. It's a bit more painterly, but the subject matter is still the same. And it's just trying to see if I can push the boundaries. Yeah, that one, Frank, that's it. On cue. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the return of the waltzer boy. Waltz yeah, Julia the Chippy. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? They are more painful. They are more painful. I still use the motion paint, though. Yeah, yeah, well, I, do. I, I was worried. I was worried that people would like start with pitchforks and, and flaming torches and drive me out to Sheffield because I've done this new style. But so far, so good. Everyone's been warm to it. There's a golf one there, look. That, that's dad skills. Being a kid at Crazy Golf. That's the skills at Butlins. Uh, are all your paintings um, emotion? Yeah. Yeah, that, the, the starting point for, for the whole thing is, is, is I went back asking someone. So the first painting I did to try it out was all the paints that my wife had bought uh, to paint the living rooms. And because she's bipolar, she's very colourful yeah. with her stuff. So it's our walls are like, Mag uh, not magnolia, what's the. Uh, no, is it magenta? Yeah, no, marigold and, and purples and stuff like this. So I got those colours to use. But they work really well, you know. They, not only, because they like a form of emulsion, uh, not emulsion, a uh, form of acrylic, where it's like 10 times cheaper. And I used to go to be in the queue. Is that the only reason? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I tried it recently, I tried using um, acrylics, and oh, they were shit. <laughs> the pictures were shit, and everything. Because they dry differently. I'm so used to like motion paint drying in about four minutes. Wow, that's why I could do 25 paintings in December. If I were using like oils, you can only do one a year. So, 
So that's why, um, yeah, I think that's probably why Vermeer only did 24 paintings. It took so long for him to paint and dry. So, yeah, so for me, I'm, I'm, I can, uh, can be very prolific, shall we say. Well, that's a great inspiration for any artist, isn't it? Yeah. You, you can do a full painting in a day or whatever. Well, exactly, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's great. Great for me to be able to use, use a medium that dries very quickly and get on with it and get on with another one. And it's kind of also not being, to, especially when you're doing an exhibition, you can let the mistakes out. You don't need to be so guarded and, and precious with what it is. You can have this, this I, I always liken it to these um, carpet weavers um, uh, in a Muslim country, I can't remember whereabouts it is, but they weave these carpets, but they put a deliberate mistake in the carpet because as for them, the only person that's perfect is God. So they deliberately put a mistake in and so for me, I don't mind putting mistakes in. It's just showing my foibles as a mere human. And, uh, so, but, but, and that's all good and well when you're doing it as a show. But if you have a commission, you can't, you've got everything to be perfect. And they become really painful things to do. So I stopped doing commissions because be, I lose sleep. Uh, like charging people so much money for a picture and it might be crap. So I can't be doing it. Um, I know it's quite hard as everyone is human to sort of praise ourselves, but what is your most proudest moment in your career so far? I think the proudest moment is just being able, be able to support my family and find something that I can do to do that. I'm just really fortunate and the fact that I'm still here now and I'm in a room with people listening to what I've got to say, it's incredible, you know, and I'll, I'll touch wood and whatever, you know, I just, I'm truly blessed to be able to provide for my family doing something that I so thoroughly enjoy. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's the proudest moment I've got. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs>